Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Russia's military says it captured more than 1,000 Ukrainian Marines defending the besieged city of Mariupol after they surrendered Wednesday. Videos broadcast on Russian state TV appear to show Ukrainian soldiers marching with their hands up. Ukrainian officials have not verified Russia's claim of a mass surrender. Russian troops have moved into the city center of Mariupol, where some 100,000 civilians remain trapped, with no power, water, telephone or Internet access and dwindling supplies of food and medicine. This is Valentina, an elderly Mariupol resident who survived weeks of heavy assaults. Why are they killing us? Why are they destroying us? Why do this to our houses? Three ten-story buildings were burnt completely. People are sitting in the basement. There is no sewer there. Plastic tubes started burning. One bay of the ten-story building crumbled. Nineteen people dead. On Thursday, Mariupol's mayor accused Russian troops of bringing mobile crematoria to the city to burn the bodies of civilians killed during Russia's assault. Meanwhile, Russia's Black Sea naval flagship has been heavily damaged in an explosion. Russia claims a fire aboard the vessel caused ammunition to explode. Ukraine says it launched a successful missile attack on the ship in the Black Sea. On Thursday, the Biden administration authorized another $800 million in new military aid to Ukraine, including howitzers and armored personnel carriers. The head of the World Health Organization says the world is failing to treat humanitarian crises in countries like Ethiopia and Yemen with the same concern provided to the people of Ukraine. Dr. Tedros Adnan Ghebreyesus spoke during Wednesday's weekly WHO press briefing in Geneva. The whole attention to Ukraine is very important, of course, because it impacts the whole world. But even a fraction of it is not being given to Tigray, Yemen, Afghanistan. Syria and the rest, a fraction. And I need to be blunt and honest that the world is not treating the human race same way. Dr. Tedros, who's originally from Ethiopia, said a three-week-old humanitarian ceasefire in the country's Tigray region has failed to prevent widespread hunger and starvation. He said some 2,000 trucks were needed to supply millions in the region with food and medicine, but that only about 20 trucks have so far arrived. In South Africa, the death toll from heavy flooding around the city of Durban has risen to more than 300 in what South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa called a catastrophe of enormous proportions and part of climate change. The disaster struck as parts of KwaZulu-Natal province received several months' worth of rain in a single day, triggering landslides that trapped people under buildings and floodwaters that swept away bridges and houses. This is a Durban resident who managed to save his children but lost all his possessions to the floods. I got no way to, to go now. I got no house. I got no nothing. The situation is very, very bad. I don't know where I'm going to sleep now. In Britain, more than two dozen scientists use superglue to attach research papers and their own hands to the windows of a government building in London Wednesday, the latest in a series of climate protests led by scientists and the group Extinction Rebellion. The protest at the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy came after the United Nations warned countries must rapidly curb their use of fossil fuels to prevent average global temperatures from increasing by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. This this is Cardiff University ecologist Dr. Aaron Thierry. I'm having to do this because our government is basically ignoring all the evidence. And we have tried all the rational, normal, evidence-based policy approaches, and they're just not acting according to it. The government's insane. And I don't know what else to do other than to do this, to try and get the attention that we need to wake the public up. In another protest, Extinction Rebellion activists occupied the Shell Oil Company's London headquarters Thursday, supergluing themselves to the building's entrances and reception desk to demand a meeting with Shell's CEO. Last week, the U.K. government unveiled a new energy strategy that calls for more North Sea oil and gas development and a larger role for nuclear power. The U.K. is also considering ending a moratorium on fracking that's been in place since 2019. 
In New York, a massive manhunt ended Wednesday when authorities arrested a 62-year-old man who's accused of shooting 10 passengers on a subway car in Brooklyn. At least 13 other people were injured in the attack, which began after the gunman released two smoke grenades in a crowded train during morning rush hour on Tuesday. The suspect, Frank James, was arrested shortly after calling a police tip line saying he was in a McDonald's restaurant in Manhattan. Federal authorities have charged the 62-year-old with carrying out a terrorist attack on a mass transit system. If convicted, he could face life in prison. Police have not yet established a motive for the attack. In a video posted online, James himself described uh, himself as a person who was once locked up for mental health issues. We'll have more on the story after headlines. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control has extended a mask mandate for all public transit passengers through May 3rd. The Biden administration's come under increasing pressure from Republicans, airline executives and business leaders who want to allow the mask mandate to expire. On Thursday, the Biden administration formally extended the U.S. coronavirus public health emergency for another 90 days. Despite the declaration, many people without health insurance report they're being charged $100 dollars or more for coronavirus tests and may face hospital bills for COVID treatment after Congress allowed emergency pandemic aid to lapse. Kentucky's Republican-led legislature has voted to effectively outlaw abortion. On Wednesday, Kentucky's General Assembly voted to override Democratic Governor Andy Beshear's veto of a bill that bans distribution of abortion pills by mail and creates onerous requirements for clinics that reproductive rights groups say will make it impossible to access abortion services in Kentucky. The law has no exceptions for people who become pregnant by rape or incest. Separately, Kentucky Republicans overrode Governor Bashir's vote of a bill that bans trans girls from athletics in public schools. A warning to our audience, our next story contains graphic footage and descriptions of police violence. In Michigan, the Grand Rapids Police Department has released video showing the fatal shooting of Patrick Leoy, a 26-year-old man, African-American, killed by a white police officer during a traffic stop last week. Leoya died after the officer, who has not been named, wrestled him to the ground kicked and hit him, attempted to taser him, pinned him on his stomach before pulling his pistol and firing a single round into Leoya's head. Attorney Ben Crump, representing his family, said the video shows unnecessary and excessive force. He called for the officer to be fired and prosecuted. Police have said the officer will not be publicly identified unless prosecutors bring criminal charges. Ahead of the video's release, activists took their protest to Tuesday night's meeting of the Grand Rapids City Commission, demanding all the officers involved in the killing be named and held accountable. I am ashamed that I am humiliated. The shame that this city, my only home, brought death to this young man who came here with dreams for a future. You too should be ashamed. You should be weeping. You should want to turn loose all associations with the city government, the sham of a city government, because you're supposed to preserve and improve the life of the residents of this place. And instead, the folks who are obligated and are under your responsibility allowed for the extinguishing of a life instead. You share the blame. The blood is on your hands, too. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has promised an independent investigation of the shooting by state police. The Justice Department has agreed to settle four cases brought by Black Lives Matter activists who were brutally cleared from a peaceful protest outside the White House just days after the murder of George Floyd. On June 1, 2020, police beat and tear-gassed peaceful protesters gathered in Lafayette Park after then-Attorney General William Barr ordered police to clear a path for President Trump to walk to the nearby St. John's Episcopal Church for an infamous photo op holding a Bible. As part of a settlement announced Wednesday, the U.S. Park Police will update policies requiring that officers wear visible identifiers and will require officers to attempt de-escalation tactics before any moves to deploy so-called less lethal weapons. 
Texas Governor Greg Abbott is facing mounting criticism over his new policy ordering state authorities to inspect commercial vehicles crossing the state's border with Mexico after the vehicles have already been checked by federal inspectors. Abbott's plan for so-called enhanced inspections has caused massive gridlock at the border, delaying shipments of food and other products. The governor of Mexico's Chihuahua state said the delays harm the economies of both countries. Texas, recibe de México más de Texas receives more than three million cargo trucks each year from Mexico. The delay in deliveries represents millions in losses in both perishable foods and serious damage to the supply chain for the U.S. and Mexican industries. On Wednesday, Texas Governor Abbott said he would ease inspections at one border crossing after Mexican officials agreed to increase border security. Meanwhile, in a political stunt, Governor Abbott bussed about three dozen asylum seekers from Texas to Washington, D.C. The migrants were dropped off Wednesday near the headquarters of Fox News, which had live cameras on the scene to cover their arrival. One immigrant rights advocate described the governor's actions as, quote, deliberate cruelty that treats human beings like pawns. And in breaking news, Elon Musk has made a $43 billion bid to buy the social media giant Twitter. Earlier this month, Musk disclosed he'd taken a more than 9 percent take in Twitter. But this latest bid would make Musk Twitter's primary owner and would take the company private. Musk is the world's richest person, with a net worth estimated at $265 billion. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh, also in New York. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world.